Thank you very much. Um, the next piece um, is a piece that is is sort of based on a uh, on another piece by Bill Evans called Peace Piece, which is just like a very simple structure that you then can um, play around with. Um, if you've got a piano at home, you can try try it afterwards, perhaps. Um, and this piece as well is going to be accompanied by some video from Steve of um, an amazing tide coming in. So I guess it could be called Tide as well as Peace Peace.
Thank you very much. Thank you again. Um, so I've got one more piece to play. Um, and before I just before I do that, if you'd like to follow what I do and see more of this sort of thing, you can find me on mostly Instagram, which is uh, at jacob.leonardus. That's Jacob with a K, dot Leonardus. Um, and I also have a gig coming up on the 19th of April um, with my partner. We are a sort of old pop duo with like this plus lots of other stuff and lots of lovely vocals from her and some lyrics and all that sort of stuff. So if you like what you hear, follow me and hear more, <laughs> I guess. Um, but the next piece um, is called, um, it doesn't really have a title, I guess. It's working title of Discovery Beyond um, and it features specifically something that hopefully will make my mum very happy um, and she's in the audience now. Um, it's a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for mums. Woo! <laughs> um, basically, a, a long time ago, um, maybe nine years ago now, um, we decided, well, I decided, sorry, to get a piano, like an old piano off Gumtree that was for free, that was very old and downtrodden. Um, and my, plan, my big plan was to take it apart and sort of make it into some other new instrument. Um, so we got it into the veranda and it stayed outside um, and I didn't do anything with it for a while. Um, but I did record every single note of that piano and ver in various different ways, like with the, you know, really aggressively, quite gently, and also one where I kind of took the mechanism away from the strings. Um, so I, I don't know if that sort of makes sense. Um, let me demonstrate. Uh, so you can have the, 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 just the, the, the hammers. And I just thought that they really sound like birds flying, I guess. So um, they, that, that sound has been in the other pieces as well, but in this one, it's going to kind of carry on for a bit. Um, and also to be joined by some birds on the screen. So um, yeah, that's sort of the basis of this next piece. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. It's kind of called Discovery Beyond slash Garden Piano. I, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs>
Thank you very much. I believe we're going to be taking a little bit of a break. I don't know if there's anything else to be said before that, but um, take a quick break and enjoy the choir in a bit. Thank you very much.
you so much for coming tonight, everybody. Um, we're so excited to be here. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's a dream come true, actually, to um, be working with footage of our namesake. Um, when I started the choir five years ago, there was something just about the symbol of memoration that just spoke volumes. Um, there's something about the togetherness, um, the synchronicity, the coming together and the just the, the intuitive synchronization of, of, of memoration birds and they're, they're so highly intelligent um, and their sense of each other is mesmerizing it's beautiful as much as it's like kind of unfathomable um, I don't know if you try to walk around like with just other humans but like trying to bump into other people not to bump into other people is quite impossible um, so how they do that in the sky while flying is quite quite amazing I think um, that sense of awareness of your your brethren um, your, your community um, that they demonstrate is it's quite awe-inspiring, and I think there's something we can all learn from as humans. Um, so yeah, that was definitely kind of part of the inspiration of starting the choir in the first place. And I, I think we do quite an amazing job. Um, I often turn up at every rehearsal, and I'm like, I don't know how these incredible humans got here. Um, <laughs> these amazing singers um, are often, you know, they're, they're artists in their own rights, and um, we've created just a really beautiful community um, of. of people of musicians um, and I hope that comes across tonight um, there's a whole bunch of other things um, to say I've got a script here um, and um, <laughs> I think we've decided that I'm probably going to just uh, take key bits from it and um, so we can just put you in a flow state as we watch the beautiful incredible footage um, captured by Martin um, and Steve, who have both stood in, in kind of marshes, you know, for hours in the cold, um, <laughs> captures, capturing this amazing footage, which, you know, is never guaranteed. I think a lot goes into wildlife documentary making that you don't see. Um, I used to live with one, and um, he told me all about how, you know, to just make what, one documentary, you'd be living in a tent for a month in Madagascar, maybe seeing a beetle or not. Um, uh, so, so much goes into it. Um, so, yeah, don't take it lightly. Um, a lot of the footage is gathered uh, from the Norfolk Broads, which also is really meaningful to me because a lot of my family are from the Norfolk, um, from the Norfolk area. Um, so that feels very meaningful. Um, <coughs> other things to say, um, we collaborated with Martin and Steve uh, during the pandemic uh, on a documentary that they made called a Garden of uh, My Garden of a Thousand Bees, which was all about urban bees. Um, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll be singing one of the songs, Spring at Last by Peter Joseph um, uh, shortly. Uh, Martin's going to come and um, say some words about his process. Um, can I just ask if anyone has a mobile phone? It'd be really helpful to make sure that it's turned off. Um, I have to say that to myself often, uh, especially when I'm telling the choir for turning their phones off, not, not turning them off and then mine goes off. So um, it's really easy to do, but it really helps us to like uh, concentrate and um, all of those things. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it's there's, there's just every, it's got everything, it's, you know. It's got the moment. It's like the wow. It's got the wow bits. It's got like the kind of, you know, there's some really trippy bits in there as well as like bits where it's like it looks like a moving Escher painting. Um, I, I don't know what, how you feel about the, you know, when I go into nature, the thing about memorations I love the most is the, the kind of cerebral thing it does to your brain when you watch um, currents in the water or like fire or something and those movements, those are the things, it feels like a brain massage. That's what I love about watching uh, memorations and, and just birds. Um, so yeah, we go in, we go out, uh, big picture, uh, we've got some bees, we've got like, a hunter scene, it's like well James Bond, um, yeah, oh, yeah, it gets gritty, no birds were harmed in the making of um, uh, this footage, um, and the um, 
songs that we're going to be singing, we've got uh, Birds by Dominique Fizami, Hide and Seek by Imogen Heap, Trans Fatty Acid by Lamb, The Crudo and Dorfmeister remix, choir remix, um, Spring at Last by Peter Joseph, Lost Word, Blessings by the Lost Word Collective, um, River by Ibei, um, some off-piste um, improvisational chords, um, uh, One by One by Grey Reverend, Bang by Badmarsh and Shri, uh, that's the Hunter, um, Hunter James Bond scene, uh, Fall Together by Poppy Ajuda and Cry to the World by Solomon Grey. So um, sit back and relax and um, our Martin will come and say hello in a bit.
When the bee comes out of its hole.
When the bee comes out of its hole, they sit there and they look out and they do this with their head. They're doing like a kind of pixel shift thing. I think what they're trying to do is make a very high resolution image that they will need to remember to return to. This garden in spring is utterly beautiful. I'm amazed that so much diversity can exist in such a small place.
there's an interesting chronology to what we've seen tonight because we started off with some, well, a bit of murmuration, really. And the interesting thing for me is that that's what I was actually doing before COVID struck. And um, that's what I was planning to do for the, for the next couple of years. And then, of course, I couldn't go anywhere. So uh, you could say I was forced to make a film about bees in my garden. And <laughs> but, um, but actually, I was very happy to do so. And it was a wonderful thing, a wonderful experience. And I've worked with so many wonderful people to make the film. And I'm very grateful that the Murmuration Choir were able to help with that song because it's a particularly, you know, for me, it, even though in the film, actually, I talk over most of it. Sorry, guys, about that. But... <laughs> But also, it's lovely for me to hear the thing um, properly in its full length with the pictures it's intended for. And that's one of the things that's exciting me about this evening is because it's, a, it's um, you know, when, when the bees was over and I got back to where I was, or it's taken me a year or a year and a half to sort of get to where I wanted to be a, a couple of years ago, going to Norfolk, going to Snettersham Beach, going and seeing what is apart from my garden or our garden, um, apart from the garden, is one of the most amazing wildlife spectacles I in the country. And, um, and it's fantastic. It's a, this is a fantastic opportunity to sort of look at pictures in a different way because, I mean, typically, you know, I would go there, gather a load of material, chop it up into little bits, make a story and stick it on TV and it'll be over in a couple of minutes. And I'm really, really happy that uh, I can collaborate with this wonderful choir to do something different because I think for both of us it's a, it's a wonderful exploration and for Steve White, the editor, who's hiding behind the curtain there. And, um, and also it's a wonderful exploration for him, sort of, you know, let's have a look at, you know, let's see if there's another way we can look at pictures, look at nature, disseminate ideas of nature, disseminate music. And so, you know, I'm sorry to say everybody here tonight, you are all guinea pigs because we've not really, have, have you done anything like this before? <laughs> No, uh, we've not really done anything like this before, so uh, so I'm sorry about the rough edges. But so I went to Norfolk. There's mud there, lots and lots of mud, thousands and thousands of birds. And the thing I was looking for, which I'm still I haven't really found yet, but I was essentially looking for how to see the relationship between the peregrine falcon that always hangs out in this place and the wading birds and. Um, because the peregrine's always there and the wading birds are always there and they know the peregrine's there and the peregrine knows they know that the peregrine's there. And I always, uh, uh, it seems to me that's a really interesting uh, situation because obviously it possibly isn't quite as simple that that is the predator-prey relationship as it is with the starlings where they all, are all just really scared of, you know, any bird of prey. They just sort of, they do all that clumping. But the the wading birds in Norfolk, it's a quite different thing so i'm still exploring but in the meantime we can just have some nice pictures with some lovely mud and some beautiful voices um so uh i will i'll leave you to uh the rest of it then enjoy <laughs> thank you very much To the wild with care, my love, and speak the things you see. Let new names take and root and thrive and grow. And even as you travel far from heaven, crag and river, may you, like a little fisher, set the stream alight with glitter. May you enter now as otter, without falter into water.
guides my soul with the help of your waters. Those old me so ashamed, let the river take them, river, drown them, come to your river. Come to your river.
change your mind Investing in a dime store Prophecy Taking you the long way down I just want to say thank you to our wonderful soloists. We've had Ellie Nags um, on the first song, um, Spring at Last. Um, then we had the wonderful Harriet Sansom um, uh, on the Lost Words Blessing. And then that was Emily Mags on um, One by One. Now for James Bond.
just want to say hello to my grandma at home. <laughs> Hi, grandma. <laughs> Shall we all say hello to our grandmas? Hi. <laughs> it's the first time we've done a live stream. I hope it's worked. She might, she might, she might not actually be working. She might not have got the memo that um, we had to change the... I knew something was going to, you know, uh, first time you try something. But ho hopefully, Grandma, you're watching. So, um, both my grandmas, Liz and Jenny, hello. Nice, uh, nice to see you if you're there. Um, and everyone else. Um, lovely. Well, we have got, I think, a couple more songs. Four together. And uh, quite a lot. So sit back and enjoy it.
I'd love um, to uh, you to have a, a lovely round of applause as well also for Steve White, who's um, been editing all of this incredible footage and has basically organised this whole concert. Um, and even even though he's hiding behind the, co the, the curtain, we should give him a big round of applause because he deserves it. Thank you, Steve. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you uh, and Martin and obviously wonderful choir as well. Um, so we're going to go into a Q&A now with, with Martin and Steve. Um, uh, so if you have... Oh, oh, you got some questions about Starlings? Um, yeah, yeah, now's the time. You got... How long you got? Um, yeah, yeah. So enjoy. Uh, feel free to get another drink. Um, and basically, the, the floor is open. Um, but in the meantime, another round of applause for these wonderful keynotes. <laughs> My name's Izzy. If I could just add, add my thanks to Izzy and the choir, because actually what I did was pretty simple, really, because I had plenty of time to do it. And Steve was more complex than my work because he uh, was difficult. But to uh, coordinate a choir of this size at an event like this, I think, is a feat of, uh, I don't know, I think it's incredible. So thank you so much. And everybody else who was involved in this, thank you so much for putting it together. Um, so apparently, <laughs> and Steve's there too, he's got answers to questions, but if anyone has any questions, please go ahead, I, quite, I can't see, I can't see into the darkness, maybe um, is, is someone up there at the lights, just turn up the lights a little bit so we can see a bit more, because... Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> you do. Hello. It's yes. Sorry. If if you could just repeat the question, I didn't catch the first of it. Yes, it's very similar with fish and with starlings in that it is a, just a kind of sheer fear thing and they do, they are less likely to be attacked if they get into the middle of the flock. But the thing I'm interested in in Norfolk is that it doesn't seem quite as simple with those birds because it, they, all the birds have got different kinds of murmuration or different kinds of flock and, um, and some of them don't bother at all. So it's very interesting to see which birds the peregrines in, in still uh, are, are scared of the peregrines, which birds don't care at all, <laughs> given that some of those birds I know peregrines will hunt anyway. So it seems to be a much more complex thing there, but certainly fish and starlings are directly similar. That wasn't trickery, that was just the camera stuck on the mud, waterproof camera I may add, and it was actually the tide coming in at normal speed, no speeding up, we just ran the shot uh, the full length, which is amazing, actually. I was very happy to see that. <laughs> Why did the sky stay the same? Is the question you're asking. Why did uh, the sky didn't stay the same. It moved. If you speed that shot up, that shot up, the the sky does move. It is. It just wasn't very long. You know, it was this. Those clouds are a long way away and not moving very quickly. I promise you that was. <laughs> I promise you, there was no trickery in that shot, <laughs> except for the underwater housing.
Um, uh, let me see. Yeah. How many hours did I spend? That's a good question. Um, a lot, though. I mean, probably I've spent about 30 days there so far, but I'm just beginning as far as I'm concerned. I'm going back tomorrow, actually, <laughs> to, to do some more. But the spring tides, it's, it's all based around the spring tide. So in summer, obviously, there's no spring tide, but also most of those birds actually breed in the Arctic. So they will be gone in a month or so. But the spring tides are bigger than normal tides, which means that they flood all of the mud, which means that many of the birds don't like to sit on vegetation or they don't like to go anywhere where, for example, a fox or a person could go. So they often, many of them, just fly up and, you know, they fly around for hours waiting for the water to recede so they can get back to their mud. I think we've got a question from... Is it the live stream? We've got a question from the live stream. So exciting! <laughs> Is it my grandma? <laughs> Ooh, good question. Is memoration a term just used for starlings and choirs? Um, no, it, it is appropriate uh, for any bird that murmurates. I, it flocks in that way as a, as a result of um, unwanted attention from predators. Sorry. Just birds or fish too? Do I think for fish it? it's called shoaling, maybe. I don't think it's been used for fish, but I could try it out and see how it goes. <laughs> Sorry, say again? Are, are memorations seasonal? Uh, yes, they're very seasonal, in particular with starlings, because they, um, cause they're not breeding. They all gather together. The reason they come here is because it's quite warm compared to where, you know, many of them come from Eastern Europe where it's bitterly cold even now. And they use the reed beds for warmth typically, but they use other places, you know, like railway stations or thick the fir forests. And because they're not breeding, they're all together and they do, you know, they do benefit from being together. They keep each other warm, but also they help defend each other from predators. Because if you imagine predators are territorial, so in a place like Ham Wall, there might be a million, even six million, I think, is the record number of starlings there. But the predators are territorial, so there's only a few predators can fit there. So in terms of, you know, there's very, very little risk for each individual starling. And it's also true for the wading birds in Norfolk. It's very seasonal because, again, they go off to the Arctic to breed when, in fact, they spread out. You know, I don't know how closely packed the nests are, but, I mean, they're sort of 100 metres apart, so they don't really flock much at all. If that's oh, we've got we've got more questions. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Well, I can't I can't see. Hello. Uh, did we <laughs> manage to catch when <laughs> oh, the peregrine good question. actually caught well, the bird? Well, there was a shot there of the peregrine did actually catch the bird, except that the bird, at the very last millisecond or couple of milliseconds, managed to just turn its body out of the way and the peregrine just grabbed empty feathers um, and I have filmed a peregrine well I did film one a couple of weeks ago trying to um, there was an injured bird in the water that it may have injured before I didn't see that bit and I was trying to pick it up but it couldn't because the bird got into the vegetation so I mean in a sense that's kind of my mission it's not so much to see the peregrine catch something it's what I'm really interested in is exactly how and exactly which member of the flock it does catch. So I'm, I'm very interested in seeing, you know, who it finds in the end. Because one thing that's very clear from all the stuff I've filmed so far is that the peregrine can't catch, or at least really not easily, can't catch uh, a perfectly he fit, healthy wader. They can outfly it every time. If it if it's down to a one-on-one -on -one chase, they always seem to beat it. Anymore? Ooh, effects of climate change um, on the birds. I haven't seen any effects of climate change, but I haven't been going there enough. And it was odd that this winter, it was so cold, in fact, um, about, uh, in January, it was so cold, it was minus seven, with a sort of strong northerly wind. It was bitter. And one of the old guys there, who's one of the old bird watchers there, he said he's never seen the ice, that he's never seen ice in that, place before so it's very confusing um 
But ultimately, any sea level rise will wipe it out because, because there's a sea wall around it. So there won't be, the, the mud won't be able to move inland with the rising sea level. It will stop. So, um, you know, I don't want to put a downer on this, but um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, the, the time is limited for that scene, that place. Uh, do, do the starlings have um, intense training to learn how to memory? <laughs> um, Obviously, feel free to leave if you need to. I don't know uh, the answer to that. I mean, certainly with the wading birds in Norfolk, the young come back. The parents don't even show them the way. The parents desert them when they're in the Arctic and they make their own way to Norfolk, but I've yet to see exactly what happens when they arrive. As regards the young starlings, I mean, I think they just follow, you know, they follow the flock. Um, but in terms of the discipline within the flock, the fact that they never, uh, really never, ever seen a collision in the flock, um, I don't know. I, I think the birds may have that just, you know, that's just their innate ability to fly, possibly. And how, how do they not bump into each other? How can we learn to not do that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I know quite a lot of people have studied it, but, uh, but I mean, one of the things that when you look at the images that we film, we're with a, um, a telephoto lens, so we've actually compressed it up. So while it looks like it's literally black with starlings, in fact, there is space between them. But I think they do have, firstly, they've got extraordinary, extraordinarily quick reactions because their eye and their brain are just like that far apart. So the nerve impulses from their eye has, it doesn't have to go as far as it does with us. And then, of course, it's a very short distance to their wings. So they have that ability. They've got quick, much, much quicker reactions than us. Um, but also, I think they can detect air currents very superbly. So I think they can, well, they do. They do it all the time. You never, ever see, not even in those really dense things, I've yet to see any kind of bird make contact with another. Very impressive. Well, that's... Uh, Tell us more <laughs> about the ongoing project. Uh, yes, the ongoing project. Well, the thing is, it's, it's quite experimental at this point because I haven't, you know, I, I'm in a, a lovely position uh, that I haven't had to write a story and I don't have an ending. <laughs> Um, and so it's a, it's a wonderful time at the moment. I'm still investigating, if you like. Um, we've got lots of material, and I will look at that material. But essentially, the basic point of the story is to understand how predators and prey relate to each other in that it's very bad for predators if they reduce their prey population, and obviously it's bad for prey population too. And so the question is... Um, maybe the prey are helping the predator to find the best among them because the predator is very good uh, for the prey population in that it helps it evolve. It's like that's why all these birds have different shaped beaks because of peregrines and other birds like them. Uh, you know, the peregrines magnify the sort of natural mutations. So what I'm tr all I'm trying to do really is just see exactly what's going on there. When a peregrine comes and looks at the flock. Um, sometimes they all get up and fly in a big flock. Sometimes they don't. And so I'm trying to find out why. Uh, and whatever I find out will be the story, whether it's, you know, whether it's one thing or another. There's no fixed idea behind it. Can I, can I ask... Um, uh, so I was reading a, a National Geographic um, article about uh, memorations, um, and uh, they were saying that... Uh, well, yeah, and I wanted to kind of ask you: Have you seen this? Have you seen the birds memorate just for fun? Well, that's uh, something that I, uh, as Without regards the wading birds, is uh, something that I guessed might happen. Um, and uh, when I started, and I have to say, no, I haven't. I mean, yes, they fly about for fun, and there's a bit of action, and they they obviously have to train to get that fit. I mean, it's extraordinary energy they're expending there so I was expecting to see more flying about for fun but actually when when it's really intense there is almost 
excuse me, there's almost always a predator there of some sort. It may not be any real threat to them. I mean, sometimes a marsh harrier just flying high in the sky above them. I mean, couldn't catch any of them unless they were sort of half dead. And that will, that will upset them. But when there's an actually a peregrine there, that's when you get the really intense um, flock formations so far. But I'm still looking, you know, still got more stuff to do. <laughs> Have we gone over time? Oh, they're all pouring in now. Uh, what time are we on? It's question for, okay, well, we've got to have a question from Steve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, have some, let's have him doing some talking now. Journey of the um, film editing with the songs. Uh, in this case, uh, I just go through all the footage listening to nice music for <laughs> hours and hours and hours and then clump it together, um, pick the choir songs. But I, I spent a good couple of months just with instrumental music before I moved into songs and then that transition was nice. And then you begin to see how, which images fit which story, fit which song and, and then change your mind and do it all differently. But <laughs> it's just a very slow process basically, but it's not... It is pleasurable, which is why we've done it. So, yeah. Anyway, who wants to say? So, so thank, you, thank you very much for everyone for coming. I really appreciate your coming. It's been a great thing for me to do and hope uh, everyone in the choir as well. And uh, let's hope to do something similar again. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Um, so please feel free to um, stay and have a drink at the bar um, and uh, ask Martin some more questions and Steve um, if you want. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, if you, if you want to stay in touch, um, you can join uh, the choir's mailing list via the, our website, memorationchoir.co.uk. We're starting a new term in uh, May uh, and, yeah, uh, inviting new singers, uh, if, if there are any budding singers out there who'd like to come and sing some lovely songs. Um, and yeah, we have some other wonderful uh, things coming up this year. Um, so yeah, stay in touch. We're also on uh, all of the places, Instagram and um, Facebook at Murmur uh, Choir. So yeah, anyway, it's lovely, lovely to meet you. Um, have a lovely evening.